I do want to say that we are running out of time in case there's technical issues with the captioning to be able to correct anything. We're ready to do that um, whenever you are. The event has to go live before I can do that. Yeah, can, can you hit yep. live? We're going. OK. It's live, guys. I don't know how much of a delay there is, but I don't see captioning on my screen when I'm viewing it. I, if anyone else sees it, please let me know. I've put up two tests. Hey, Heidi, we saw it. Perfect, thank you so much. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Dawn Jeffries, and I am the moderator of the President's Town Hall with Virginia Tech President Tim Sands. Thank you all so much for joining us for this live webinar. Just to let you know, we are recording our session today and we'll make this available for viewing. Throughout this next hour, President Tim Sands will share information about Virginia Tech's efforts in handling the impact of COVID-19. Members of the university's incident response team are also joining us and they be, may be called upon to comment or share some details as we get into the question and answer portion of our webinar. Speaking of our question and answer portion, President Sands just wanted to let you know we have more than hundred questions already coming in and they're coming in steadily. So uh, please continue to submit your questions and we'll get to as many as we can this morning. And with that said, President Sands, uh, why don't you start us off with telling us where things stand? Thank you, Don, and thanks to all of you for participating in this town hall meeting. Before I proceed to uh, an update on the impact of COVID-19 on the people and operations of Virginia Tech, 
I'd really like to take a moment to recognize and thank those individuals in our community and our institution and frankly around the country who are helping the rest of us manage through this pandemic. Our healthcare workers, first responders, and those responsible for maintaining our food, energy, and sanitation needs, thank you. And to the students, employees, alumni, fa family members, and friends who are suffering from or are who are close to someone who has succumbed to COVID-19, we are here for you. We can't be physically proximate right now, but we can support you. Please do reach out to Hokie Wellness or Cook Counseling. They are entirely online. Nobody can, can adequately predict or fully prepare for a global pandemic like COVID-19. But we did begin to build institutional preparedness for the many streams of impact that characterize this pandemic through our formal enterprise risk management program that we began three years ago. 12 years ago, Virginia Tech made a critical decision to stand up the Office of Emergency Management and build a nationally recognized team of experts and programs. Guided by our campus emergency management plan and our hours of emergency training and preparedness, we, are, we have been able to respond more effectively during this unprecedented time. Virginia Tech's response began in late January when our Global Travel Oversight Committee recognized the need to consider bringing Hokies abroad back to the US as some countries move to level two and level three uh, CDC advisories. We then activated our incident management team and incident response team meeting several times a day by Zoom to inform and make major decisions to protect the health and safety of Hokies everywhere. I'll refrain from listing all of the significant decisions that have been made over the last two months. You've all been living with those decisions. Instead, I'll provide a few updates on the consequences of those decisions. First, let me address teaching and learning. This is a major op operation that has shifted entirely to remote synchronous or asynchronous modes. In a 10 day period, 4,500 spring course sections were transferred from in-person to remote delivery by 2,400 faculty and instructors. This has been a Herculean effort, uh, I call it the great pivot, that has required extraordinary effort by faculty, instructors, teaching assistants, IT staff and support, TELOS, and of course, every Virginia Tech student. The process has gone better than anyone could have reasonably expected. It hasn't been perfect and we are all learning quickly about what can and cannot be done remotely. The good news is that we will have new tools and experience going forward that will make teaching and learning more resilient and more flexible, both of which will benefit the learner and our faculty going forward. We will stay in this mode through summer and I'll address fall in just a moment. The second biggest operation has been the great relocation. Since our recognition that the pandemic was coming our way in early March, we have depopulated campus residences in Blacksburg from over 10,000 students before spring break to less than 500 today. Each individual remaining has good reason for staying. This has allowed us to move to single occupancy and to free up some residence halls for other uses should the need arise. The reduction of the student population in the surrounding community has been less dramatic, but still substantial with about 40% remaining in Blacksburg. Once everyone was settled into this new reality, the adherence to physical distancing and staying at home when possible has actually been extraordinary. Uh, there was a, I learned about an outdoor toilet paper fight a few nights back, but even then the participants maintained physical distance. We just regret any waste of this surprisingly precious commodity, <laughs> even if it is the Virginia Tech single ply special. Along with the de-densification of the student population has come the transition to teleworking for the majority of Virginia Tech employees. More than 80% of our roughly 10,000 employees are teleworking. For salaried and non-student wage workers, we are committed to employing you through the end of the semester the current frontier of our completed planning. We're continuing to look for opportunities to shift essential functions offsite where practical. For those employees funded through external funding sources, we are looking for every opportunity to maintain your support. Some funding agencies are allowing the continuation of employment. 
where there are gaps, we are looking for Virginia Tech resources that can be utilized. Federal work study students have guaranteed funding through the, through the uh, term of their award. For student wage work workers, most of you rely on this income to pay for a portion of the cost of attendance. We are reassigning as many of you as possible. For those who cannot be accommodated through teleworking and who are experiencing financial hardship, we're directing you to the Dean of Students Office for support. In a partnership between financial aid, the Student Opportunities and Achievement Resources, or SOAR, and the Dean of Students, we're working to address acute financial need. I'd like to thank the recent donors to the Student Emergency Fund, including 11 members of the university's leadership team. It's making a difference in the lives of our undergraduate, graduate, and professional students who are experiencing financial hardship associated with COVID-19. While I'm on the topic of finances for the spring semester, we have received many questions about fees for service, comprehensive fees, and tuition. With respect to fees for service, that is fees paid by individual students for services provided to that individual student, we are providing rebates for on-campus housing contracts that have been terminated, rollovers or refunds for dining, and refunds for parking. With respect to tuition, since we're still teaching, albeit through remote, remote means, we are not offering tuition refunds for the spring semester. Our goal is to ensure that as many of our students as possible complete the semester with the academic progress they had anticipated when the semester began. In fact, remote teaching under these circumstances is much more costly to deliver than in-person instruction. It's not what any of us had planned and it's a temporary condition. In fact, I fully expect that this experience will result in more flexibility for students and faculty in the future. With respect to comprehensive fees, this fee structure is de designed to make a range of services available to all students whenever they are needed without the cumbersome process of charging at the point of service. One student may only use a few of these services in a given semester, whereas another may use a different set. Now that the university has settled into the essential operations mode, we are assessing which of these services are no longer available in person or virtually. We will have a decision soon on whether a refund will be offered. Although the financial status of university operations is fairly clear through the end of the semester and even into the summer, we do not yet have the information we need to plan for next academic year. We've not yet received promised federal support and the Commonwealth of Virginia, the source of a quarter of our instructional funding, does not yet have clarity on the depth of the revenue shortfall or the degree to which this will be mitigated by federal programs. Once we have this information, and we have a clearer picture of the public health guidelines that, that we will follow in the fall, we'll be able to announce our plans for the next academic year. Based on the status of the pandemic and the timing of federal and state decisions, we're expecting to announce fall plans in early June. In the meantime, we are curtailing discretionary spending and freezing new hiring in concert with instructions from the governor. Speaking of the progress of the state of public health, I'd like to offer a brief update on COVID-19 in the Commonwealth. As of this morning, we have over 4,000 confirmed positive cases in Virginia, 17 in Montgomery County, and two Virginia Tech students in Blacksburg who do not live on campus. Also, we have at least two employees in Northern Virginia who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. The time lag associated with testing and reporting is still about a week to 10 days. These numbers will certainly grow over the next several days and perhaps weeks. I want to commend our faculty, staff, and students for their extraordinary response to the public health mandates and best practices. Those who have tested positive or, or who have symptoms have self-isolated and 1,900 people have registered with the Virginia Tech post-travel system 1,430 of which have self-quarantined as a result of a risk assessment. I have no doubt that the spirit of Prosum is helping us flatten the curve locally. The IHME predicts that the peak for Virginia will be in late April, uh, but we may drift into, as, drift into May um, in this region. We just don't know for certain. I'd like to finish on an appropriately optimistic note not to dismiss the tragedy and disruption we are currently experiencing, it is real and demands our immediate attention. But we've already seen remarkable evidence of resilience 
in our Hokey community that defines itself by shared experiences in service to others. I'm incredibly impressed with our researchers, students, and staff, and faculty for their pivot. Of all of our mission areas, research is perhaps the most disrupted and chaotic. Yet we are scrambling to develop vaccines, improve testing, adapt ventilator, ventilators using 3D printing, and rapidly produce much needed personal protective equipment. Our scholars are offering their expertise to the public, reminding the public why we have research universities. Expertise matters, especially in times like these. As we work our way through the pandemic, Virginia Tech will be even better positioned to lead. Our expertise in developing and securing the digital economy, our comprehensive strength at the intersection of human health, animal health and the environment, what we refer to as One Health, and our focus on the human condition in a world of human cyber networks, all stand out as just what the post-pandemic world will need. As for the fall, I'm optimistic that we'll be back in business. Of course, the health of our students, employees, and our communities will be paramount. Life on campus will be different going forward, but in many ways, it can and will be better. To quote our beloved poet, Nikki Giovanni, we are strong and brave, and innocent and unafraid. We are better than we think and not quite what we want to be. We are alive to the imaginations and the possibilities. Thank you and I'll turn it back over to Dawn and we'll take some questions. Thank you, President Sands. Um, a lot of questions um, coming in. I'm gonna try and consolidate as many as possible so we can get in as many as possible. But a lot of folks are asking about commencement. Could it be possible to schedule a ceremony this summer or perhaps in the fall that will replicate the May commencement ceremonies? It would be wonderful to do that. Um, we explored that possibility in depth uh, several weeks ago when we were felt we had to make a decision about commencement. We knew that the May commencement, the traditional in-person commencement was not going to work. Even in the best case scenario, we had uh, the, the need to um, impose or, or maintain uh, physical distancing and other criteria that uh, really are necessary to flatten the curve. So we decided to go with a virtual ceremony on May 15th, and you're gonna be hearing more about that shortly. I think uh, it's not a substitute for the in-person ceremony, but it's something that will mark the day. And I think you'll be impressed with the, how interactive it is and, and the quality of the, the experience, even if it is virtual. The other two uh, options we have are to uh, have our students come to the December 2020 commencement, where they'll be recognized as 2020 graduates, or wait until the spring of 2021. Uh, the other, the fourth opportunity that we're offering, which is not a substitute for commencement, it's just uh, should be a fun time, is to recognize our graduates at the football game on September 26th, conditions permitting. We don't know exactly what our state will be in September. We're hopeful, but, uh, but we'll have to just see and see how things develop. Uh, it would be great to schedule a commencement, um, a regular commencement, but the reality is that we need time to do that and we need uh, uh, everybody who would want to participate would also need time for planning. And we're, we decided that uh, it just didn't make sense to uh, organize something that we thought might have to be postponed maybe many times. So I think uh, you'll enjoy the, the process. I do feel for our seniors because uh, they're, they're, they've been looking forward to this in-person commencement on May 15th for four or five years. And, and this is, is a big loss, but uh, we're all making do the best we can. And uh, I, think, I think you'll enjoy it. For those who participate, I think you'll be impressed. A faculty member is asking if Virginia Tech's shared governance is still functioning whether faculty senate and commissions and committees such as curriculum committees are actually still meeting? Yes, yeah, a good question. Uh, yes, uh, we are, are actually operating um, in a pretty normal mode except for via Zoom. Uh, we had our university council meeting, the last one entirely uh, via Zoom and with remote uh, voting and everything worked, I thought, beautifully. Uh, but yes, uh, operations are proceeding, shared governance is active. Uh, it's, it's mostly via Zoom. It's not in person at all. So uh, I, think, I think that will continue uh, through, well, obviously through the semester. And, uh, and as we approach the, 
academic year, we'll, we'll reconsider what we can do in person, but uh, I think everything's moving along quite well. And this question comes from a student who is asking how Virginia Tech will support students who have to take, of their, take care of their families or even mourn the loss of a loved one because of the coronavirus while also trying to um, maintain their student status and their classwork. Certainly we've heard stories and we know that there are many students uh, who are suffering right now for various reasons who are struggling uh, being at home, uh, dealing with the remote um, online situation uh, compounded with uh, financial stress on families, with uh, illnesses, and in some cases with COVID-19 directly. Uh, we, all of our services are here hook and operating, Hokie Wellness, Cook Counseling Online, uh, the, the Dean of Students Office, SOAR, so even though it's virtual, please do reach out, even if you're not in Blacksburg, reach out online and connect with us so that we can offer you support as needed. Uh, we'll, we will, uh, I hope this, does, this uh, experience is over quickly and that we can recover quickly, but, but uh, we have to prepare for weeks, if not months of, uh, of disruption. And uh, we're not gonna let down in terms of our support for you. A current staff member is asking if the university is doing anything or has plans to do anything to help employees who um, are still having to come into work in terms of giving them protective gear like gloves or masks. Uh, maybe let me turn that over to I believe we have Brian Gary, our vice president for um, human resources, uh, who could perhaps address that question. Um, if not, Dwayne Pinckney, uh, our Senior Vice President and Chief Business Officer. Hey, thank you, President Sands, um, and thank you for the question. We have made every effort to provide uh, PPE, uh, protect, uh, protective equipment for our staff uh, who continue to come to campus to support our operations and um, our emergency management team and uh, Mike Mulher and Mike might be on the call uh, could say more about the details around that planning, uh, but we certainly have uh, provided equipment. We will continue to provide equipment to those individuals, uh, particularly those individuals who are more likely to come into contact um, with uh, either through the, the nature of their work, they are uh, in closer proximity to areas that might be potentially hazardous. Um, we certainly are providing equipment uh, for those individuals. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, President Stan's current staff members are also uh, worried during this time for a number of reasons. Some are referencing rumors that they're hearing about pending furloughs or layoffs. Um, would you address that and what your administration is considering? Well, we are certainly, um, uh, I think, in good shape through the end of the semester. And uh, the summer has come into focus as we've decided to go all online. And that will have impact a lot of programs. Into the fall, which is where we start to have some uncertainty, we're very, as I mentioned, very much dependent on the state and federal government and their uh, efforts to uh, mitigate this uh, crisis. So um, the governor several days ago asked us to freeze hiring and to reduce or eliminate discretionary spending in order to essentially save up resources that might be needed to address any holes in the budget come the fall. So uh, unfortunately, we don't know what our status is going to be in the fall yet from a financial perspective. Um, I'm optimistic. I think we have uh, good momentum and we were prepared in many ways uh, to address uh, a crisis from a financial perspective. But uh, I think it'll be early June before we have a lot of clarity there. There are no planned um, uh, reductions in staff going forward for the fall for the, for the next academic year. Uh, we, we don't know what the future will hold, but at the moment, um, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to uh, maintain close to normal operations going into the academic year. Again, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I'm hopeful, too, that the state, based on what I've heard from the governor's office, um, is prioritizing uh, minimizing disruption uh, to state agencies and to universities, from higher ed in general, and K-12. So uh, I, I think the priorities are right. Uh, but we have uh, have to find out what what our status is over the next several weeks. 
I have two related questions, similar questions to that. Uh, one from a current staff member who is asking if there's a pay guarantee wage for the month of May. Uh, let me turn that over to uh, our senior vice president, uh, Dwayne Pinckney. Uh, Don, uh, could you uh, could you repeat your question again relative to uh, uh, pay? Absolutely. A current staff member is asking if there is a pay guarantee for wage for the month of May. Okay, thank you for the question. For wage workers. Yes. Um, uh, earlier in the president's uh, remarks, uh, the president indicated that um, we did make, there is an institutional decision uh, to continue the employment of our employees, including wage, um, for the balance of the, of the academic year. So that is an institutional decision that was made fairly early on um, with the onset of the COVID crisis, um, and that decision holds. Thank you. Um, President Sands or Dr. Pinkney, with the state hiring freeze, a current faculty member is asking how the university will actually determine what vacant positions will be deemed essential when determining whether those positions would be filled or um, posted. Uh, since it's a faculty member asking the question, perhaps I could ask our, our provost, Cyril Clark, to address that question. Thank you. I'd be pleased to do that. Um, so it really depends on the specific case. Uh, we already have uh, quite a bit of information from the respective uh, academic and other units as to what the essential functions are within those units and who the uh, essential personnel are within those units too. And so we will, we will follow the guidance provided uh, from those units and then frame that within the broader context of our university understanding of what is essential for the university to function, but in a manner that, uh, that really preserves uh, and secures the health safety risk mitigation efforts. Um, an alumnus is asking this question, certainly something we've been talking a lot about before this current uh, state of affairs. An alumnus, President Sands, is asking what the fiscal restrictions will have in relation to the computer science programs as part of the innovation campus. I'm pretty certain that's a good question. It's something we asked early on. Um, the effort in the tech talent investment program that the state is committed to is a high priority. And all the signals we're getting from the state are that we're going to maintain that program because it's actually going to be critical to coming out of this crisis in, in better shape than we are at the moment with respect to our dependence on the digital economy, uh, on the security of that, um, that economy. And Virginia Tech, as well as other uh, institutions in the Commonwealth that really, I think, rallied around this, uh, this need for not only for Virginia, but for the country to, uh, to build up our capability in uh, supporting and securing the digital economy. So yes, I think that will be a priority going forward. Everything we're hearing is it's a go. Um, of course, we'll find out uh, downstream the severity of the uh, the budget crisis from the state point of view, but I, I'm, I'm confident that will be protected and we're acting as if it's going forward uh, full speed. Right, and President Sand, several students have reached out, particularly students who work in campus dining halls or other part-time jobs, and they're concerned about what the impact this pandemic will have on their ability to pay their tuition or to pay their rent, and if the university will be able to support them in any way. We are aware of that challenge, and um, uh, we know that, as I mentioned a little bit earlier when I was giving an overview, that uh, we have a lot of student wage workers that um, have been displaced by the COVID-19 crisis and by the depopulation of the Blacksburg campus especially, uh, and that a lot of those students really depend on their student wage work to, uh, to meet their cost of attendance. So um, we have a couple of opportunities there and some of them have moved into practice. One is that we've tried to, for those who are displaced, try to find uh, teleworking arrangements or if they're on campus to reassign them if their current job is not uh, needed or somehow is, uh, uh, has been uh, essentially uh, uh, made uh, uh, obsolete, if you will, temporarily. So uh, that's one uh, el element that we'll continue pursuing. The other is that uh, we are really encouraging students who are in financial stress and 
Some of these may be uh, students who are uh, student wage workers who lost their positions. Others may be um, uh, have other reasons for financial stress, perhaps associated with the, a change in their family status due to COVID-19 and, and some of the uh, furloughs and job losses that have occurred around the country. So um, we ask you to reach out to Virginia Tech. Um, certainly the, the Dean of Students Office, uh, SOAR, if you're familiar with that program, uh, if you come to them and uh, explain your situation and apply for uh, urgent or acute financial need support, um, they'll review that and, and act as quickly as possible in coordination with financial aid with the Dean of Students Office and SOAR. So uh, we, we realize that there's a gap and we're trying to fill it. We want you to finish on time and we want you to make the academic progress that you had planned at the beginning of the semester and we'll do whatever we can to make that happen. That leads me to this next question, which actually comes from us from a parent of an incoming student. Um, President Sands, are there options for incoming freshmen to perhaps take a gap year so that they start in the fall of uh, 2021? We're actually uh, working on that and other options right now. Um, as I said, it will probably be early June before we have real clarity on that. But um, uh, we are considering all sorts of options depending on uh, the situation of the student and also the condition on campus. Maybe I can invite uh, Cyril Clark to comment on that if he has anything to add. Uh, certainly, as President Sands uh, indicated, we are in the process of, of thinking through the details uh, to create various alternatives in terms of what the, the full semester can look like. Um, and included among those, of course, is the consideration of uh, the use of online learning uh, versus the opportunity to restore in-person learning and, and, and maybe some combination of both. Uh, as we go forward, I might add, however, that our uh, admissions process is actually at Virginia Tech very robust at this time. And so uh, despite the fact that we made many fewer offers this year relative to last year when we were over-enrolled, uh, we are still um, experiencing a very robust acceptance rate. And so it's clear that there are many students offered admission who are very excited about joining Virginia Tech this coming fall. Thank you, Provost Clark. President Sands, I have uh, several questions related to um, housing to ask next. First, some students as well as parents are asking what uh, advice you would give to students who may have to sign leases for the fall? That's a great question. Um, really, we are not going to know what the situation is clearly until, as I said, about early June. If we have clarity before that, uh, we'll certainly share that. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, we're looking at uh, fall that will be as normal as possible, but uh, respecting public health guidelines. So it's not gonna be exactly the same, but uh, it, will be, um, it, it will be close to, as close to normal as we can make it. In terms of um, operating, we're going to operate in one way or another. So if the question is whether one wants to uh, uh, take on a lease in Blacksburg, you know, we, Virginia Tech doesn't get directly involved in that kind of a transaction, but uh, um, I, I would say right now that um, we, the worst case scenario is we're operating like we're operating now, in, that, in which case we have about 40% of our normal Blacksburg resident students uh, living in Blacksburg. Uh, it's, you know, it's remote still, even though it's adjacent, uh, but uh, it, it is a, a workable way to go. Frankly, I think we're going to be in a much better state by the time we get to the fall. Uh, so that uh, living in Blacksburg is going to be um, a, a very good option. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, at this point advise against uh, looking for housing in Blacksburg um, or in the neighboring communities. Uh, but I would only say that uh, it'll be weeks, if not a couple of months, before we have real clarity on that. And it's nothing that we can control at this point. It's really uh, how the disease progresses. The kind of control we can exercise is what we're all doing right now, which is uh, practicing distancing, uh, making sure that we uh, practice good hygiene, wash our hands, that everything that you've heard ad nauseum by this point, uh, we have to maintain that. And the more we do as a community in that regard, the faster we'll have clarity on whether the fall is going to look like a 
normal fall or a modified fall. You touched on this a bit, but I'll ask you to elaborate a little bit because a parent is asking, uh, now that classes have all moved online, obviously, and many students, the majority of them have returned home, um, does Virginia Tech have any influence in the area with landlords for rent options for April or May? No. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we talk to landlords, we talk to the town of Blacksburg. Uh, we, we're not directly involved in, in the housing that's offered through the community. But, um, but I think everybody's aware that this is an unusual situation. And, and I would hope that our landlords would be flexible and would, uh, would account for the fact that this is really unprecedented times. We're, we're going through a, an experience now that is unlike anything uh, from the last 100 years. So um, I don't know if any of our other panelists would like to uh, comment on that one. Just raise your hand or unmute your mic. Well, I guess, I guess I'm holding the bag on that one, but uh, I would encourage our, um, our la local landlords to, to think about how to um, uh, really come out of this in the fall with uh, the best possible outcome for, for them and for the students. And uh, I think flexibility is going to be the key. As I refresh and get some more questions as they're continuing to come in, Provost Clark, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, can you just fill us in on how online learning is going? This was quite the transition for our faculty and students. Yes, thank you. I'd be pleased to. Um, what the faculty of the university have accomplished and what the students have worked for, through is really remarkable. Uh, within a period of uh, less than two weeks, uh, our institution pivoted uh, to an online system that involved uh, approximately 2,400 faculty delivering uh, somewhere close to 4,500 course sections. And it's not just the online learning itself that was an important element to accomplish, but the online advising, the tutorial services, all of those student support services that are so important in accomplishing and facilitating academic success of students. Um, I have received uh, a lot of input from various from various quarters, and uh, and on the whole. Um, the university, especially the faculty and the students, uh, are accomplishing this transition remarkably well. Uh, that's not to say, however, um, that we don't lament and recognize um, that in the online learning format, it's more difficult for us to accomplish a lot of the hands-on, minds-on learning methodology that I think is uh, recognized to be Virginia Tech strength. And so while this is not impossible due, uh, in an online format, uh, we recognize that while we're doing well, um, we, we are disappointed in many respects that we have uh, a, a decrease in those uh, hands-on sort of minds-on experiences that are important to learning. Thank you, Provost Clark. That um, relates to a question that some folks are asking about research as well and how uh, research can be address. President Sands, I don't know if you want to take that one or perhaps Don Taylor to talk about that and, and how we're accommodating. Well, I did uh, say a little bit about that, but I'd like to uh, ask Don to um, our Vice President for Research and Innovation to comment if he, if he would. Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. I can hear you. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, so we're, we're trying to be as normal as we possibly can be in research, although we have had to shut down um, uh, the access to many of our labs. So um, uh, we are uh, doing everything that we can um, off campus. And certainly many of our researchers are able to be fully productive in their own homes or, or wherever they're uh, operating off campus. And we're also trying to shift some of the work around a bit. So uh, in some cases, there would be laboratory work that we can't do right now. So we're trying to do things like uh, literature reviews and other things that are part of the research process as well. So we're not hitting on all eight cylinders, uh, so to speak, uh, but we are doing uh, quite well. And uh, wherever there's an opportunity for us to, to make a, um, uh, an impact, we're trying to make sure that we, we do that. And we're also trying to make sure that we um, uh, put safety ahead of everything. So, so that's uh, important. We're also doing quite a bit of work that's re related to COVID-19 research. In fact, uh, the next meeting after this one will be uh, a meeting where we're trying to pull together seed funding to support internal research groups that are putting together proposals for, for external work that will help in the immediate crisis. 
So um, we're, we're trying to be uh, very proactive in, in helping with this crisis, maintain whatever we can out of our existing research program, and also trying to ramp, uh, uh, figure out how we can ramp up quickly uh, after the crisis ends. So uh, if there are other questions, I could answer those, but that's basically where we are right now. Great, thank you. Uh, President Sands, I know that you, as well as members of your incident response team, uh, work very well and have before this current crisis with the town of Blacksburg. Can you or members of your team talk about that relationship and talk about the work and the collaboration? Uh, uh, yes, let me talk, turn that over though to uh, uh, Kevin Faust. Uh, Kevin, uh, I think I see you over there. Former chief of police, he's with MacBab, our chief of police. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, everybody. Good question. Um, the relationship between uh, Town Gown, uh, Blacksburg, and Virginia Tech remains as strong, if not stronger, than ever. Um, unfortunately, this area has dealt with tragedies and crises before and has pulled together very, very well. It's become really, in my estimation, a model for the rest of the country and how these types of relationships uh, can develop and how incredibly important they are. There is a regional health task force that Mac sits on uh, with some of his officers and some other folks from Virginia Tech with the town, with the county, with Virginia Department of Health. They meet every morning. They're talking about issues. Uh, one of the things they did, for example, was set up the uh, regional drive up testing site. Uh, and so we're participating with the town uh, on that. Um, I've said it many times before, and I'll say it again in my, my law enforcement career, traveling and working around the world, I have never seen the types of relationships that I have seen here in Southwest Virginia. And so they remain as strong as ever. Uh, and we're going to come out at the, at the end of this even stronger, in my opinion. You talked about the town gown relationship. And I know there's also a town gown committee. Uh, Frank Shushak chairs that. Frank, did you want to touch on that and, and that relationship and the work that's gone into these discussions over the last few weeks? Sure. I Thanks, Don, and I appreciate that question. And I want to reiterate what what Kevin just shared, which is that relationships are quite strong. Um, many people know that the town gown committee meets once a month, and it's open to anyone. Um, but the best thing about that is it creates strong relationships. So um, when issues do arise, that people feel comfortable having candid and honest dialogue, particularly about the ways different decisions impact different entities um, in town and on campus. Uh, and so we talk about uh, all sorts of things like uh, um, uh, what behavior was like off campus at the beginning part of this uh, uh, crisis and, and how we might work together to educate the community and understand different perspectives. Uh, and so um, we're able to make adjustments and pivot uh, there's also something called the Town Tech Lunch that happens on a regular basis with the mayor, senior administrators at Virginia Tech, town council members. Um, but the key thing is I think we understand that there's a symbiotic relationship that the strength of Virginia Tech is also strength for the town of Blacksburg and strength for the town of Blacksburg is strength for Virginia Tech. We're all in this together and working together and caring about the whole is something that we're all committed to do. Thank you. Uh, President Sands, this next question comes from another parent of an incoming student. And you've talked a lot about how fluid things are um, because we just don't know what's going to happen. But this parent wants to know about summer orientation for freshmen, obviously. That's scheduled to be online, as we know. But they're asking if the university would consider having fall move-in dates earlier to allow for any type of orientation programming for these incoming students. I'm going to pass it on off to uh, Frank Shushak, our VP for Student Affairs. Yeah, sure. I, I, I think, Don, uh, we are exploring all those options. Uh, and the question that you're asking, particularly about our, a different move-in schedule and what might happen in advance of the regular semester is, is something that is very much on the table. I think the key thing for us is, is uh, not to be held by what has been, but what should be given the kind of experience that we want to create for students. And so we're working hard to explore a variety of different options. And if that ends up being a different kind of entry, 
matriculation in the fall, then we, we will do that because uh, the kind of experience and the kind of commitment that we have to our students remains unchanged no matter what the circumstance is. I appreciate that. Thank you. Another perspective student is asking a question. We have a lot of them um, asking about SAT and ACT tests. We know a lot of these test sites have canceled tests, but will students applying to Virginia Tech um, have to submit scores for SAT tests given that they're on hold for taking them right now? Thank you. I'm going to pass that off to Cyril Clark, our provost. Yeah, it turns out that we're actually in the midst of considering that that very question. And uh, just just this morning, uh, I referred the question with a recommendation uh, from the uh, Enrollment Management Advisory Committee, as well as the leadership. I referred the question to the Faculty Senate. And that's an important step that we need to go through uh, as, we, as we consider our strategy here, because in our shared governance system, uh, in reference to a question posed earlier, our shared governance system is a very important one. And it's in intentional and that it engages faculty in important decisions that have to do with academic standards and curriculum and elements of admission as well. And so we, uh, we look forward to having a definitive answer uh, to that question in the very near future. But I can assure you that we are well aware that it's really difficult uh, for students to meet that particular admissions requirement at this time. And we want to, as much as possible, facilitate uh, their entry into this university community. Thank you. And speaking of entry, uh, Provost Clark, this question may be for you as well. It's about a uh, potential uh, transfer student and whether the COVID-19 impact will, will influence the process for transfer students. So uh, as I'm sure many applicants are aware that the transfer process, the timing of that occurs a little later than the, than the regular admissions process. So we really are in the midst of the regular admissions process at this, tri at this time and monitoring uh, the response to that. As I indicated, um, so far it's been robust. Uh, that does not mean, however, that the transfer program is unimportant. And so um, we, uh, we certainly hope to move, a, uh, move ahead with that in the near future, but the specific dimensions uh, of that program uh, still have to be calibrated and decided. Thank you. Um, President Sands, you touched on this very early on, but a lot of questions are still coming in related to this. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, reinforce or, or elaborate if you would wouldn't mind. A lot of folks are asking about tuition and fees and whether there will be refunds for students given the current um, changes. Yes, I, I did. I think I addressed that, um, I hope with some clarity, but I'm happy to reinforce the, some of the things I said because there are some things that are still fluid. With respect to tuition, uh, tuition is um, uh, actually not a, uh, a fee for service, if you will. It's, it's, a, it's necessary resources that we need to operate the university. And if anything, under the remote instruction, especially the pivot to it, our, our instructional costs are, have gone up, not down. Uh, but um, so we're not uh, anticipating, we're, we're not going to give uh, refunds on tuition for the spring semester. Um, we are still looking at what happens past the spring semester, but for the spring semester, no. Um, our board of visitors will be meeting over the next several weeks. We don't know exactly when because it's dependent on uh, some relief that we need to receive from the General Assembly uh, in Virginia. But uh, when that happens, we will be talking about tuition and fee levels going forward. Um, I anticipate that the board will be able to make a decision, but we may have to revisit it as time uh, goes on because of the fluidity of the, the situation. With respect to fees for service, we have been able to um, uh, rebate or roll over or uh, refund um, uh, those fees as appropriate. And I mentioned earlier the nature of comprehensive fees, which are still under uh, study right now. Uh, most of the services that we have been um, offering through the comprehensive fee have been maintained or switched over to uh, online capability. There are a few that we're looking at that are not available in, the, in, the, in a format that is readily accessible to students either off campus or on. 
So we are reserve or we are continuing to look at those and see whether there might be a possibility of offering some sort of a temporary uh, refund for those uh, those fees. But that's still a discussion that's ongoing. The uh, parent is asking if there are any uh, considerations for moving the admissions deadline for the incoming freshman class. They're noting that other schools have actually moved their deadlines to uh, later in the in the summer, actually. Uh, I turn that over to Provost Clark. Thank you. We are, of course, uh, taking note of and keeping track of the announcements and decisions being made by other institutions, uh, but then interpreting those in the context of our particular process here. Uh, at this point in time, uh, given the robust nature of the admissions process um, and the re uh, response uh, to our offers um, of um, joining Virginia Tech, uh, we do not at this time see a need for Virginia Tech to delay beyond a May 1st deadline. Thank you. Uh, President Sands, a faculty member in Arlington is actually asking if there are any fundraising opportunities to offer support for students. Yes, actually, the, uh, I mentioned the emergency uh, student fund uh, that we are actively fundraising for right now. We've gotten, uh, I think, uh, somewhere around 80 or 90 uh, new donations. We have a generous donor who really funded the initial program. Uh, we have faculty, we have uh, administrators, staff who are, are giving to it. So yes, that's an active fund. And you can, if you uh, enter student emergency fund, um, dean of students, uh, you can get to it at Virginia Tech. Um, Frank, did you want to say something, our vice president for student affairs, because he oversees that fund? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing I want to say is that because uh, uh, there have been a number of questions about what do I do if I'm struggling and I'm a student, uh, and that my, my advice is please contact the dean of students office so they can understand your very specific circumstance. Uh, I know that uh, this crisis impacts people differently and uh, you may need some help. And so if you don't know where to start, start with the Dean of Students Office. The second part of that is thank you for the person who asked that question because there is enormous need. A lot of students are struggling in unexpected ways and uh, uh, the Dean of Students Emergency Fund, um, we can, it's on the COVID-19 web link uh, where you can make your contribution. And, and I really encourage you to do so if that's something you feel compelled to do. And what I can promise you is that there's a student out there that will receive assistance who really does need it to get through the next couple months um, in route to their education. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we have Charlie Flager, I believe, also on our panel, our Vice President for Advancement. Charlie, did you want to add anything? You know, I think the best way people can help is to, to really uh, look on our website or the COVID-19 website. Both have a great place where people can contribute to the uh, Student Enrichment Fund. I think it's the best place to go. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, President Sands, as you've mentioned, this is a really tough time for students and faculty. So I'll ask you if you can touch on Hokie Wellness and some of the opportunities, some of the resources available for students and faculty as well. Yes, if you go to Hokie Wellness on our website, um, I think you'll be impressed by what is offered online right now. Uh, and everything from your physical well being to your uh, emotional and, and mental health can be addressed at, by programs through Hokie Wellness. And of course, we have Cook Counseling and other resources that uh, are there to support you. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to support our students and our faculty and our, our staff. Uh, but uh, there's no question that we alone can't meet that need. It's a, it's a community need. We all have to pitch in and support those who are struggling, whether it be financial or struggling with the disease or with, with uh, lost um, income, whatever it may be, it really is going to take the entire community to get us through this. So I'd like to actually thank um, the many Hokies who've already stepped up, uh, whether it be donating resources to support our students uh, or just reaching out, developing programs for, um, 
for wellness through Hokie Wellness. It's, it's quite impressive. I, I've been amazed. We've always had a great operation there that has been truly beyond boundaries. In the last several years, it's been it's crossed the organizational boundaries to really focus holistically on the wellness of our employees and our students. And uh, it's never been stronger than it is now as a result of the need. So do check out the, the website, take a look, and you might be surprised at what resources are there for you. Please take advantage of them as well. And we've spoken about research this morning. And this next question comes from a faculty member here in Blacksburg who is asking if there are tools for faculty finding and bringing new research funding opportunities uh, for Virginia Tech. And if the answer to that is yes, when the faculty can start that search process? That's a great question. And uh, the answer is yes, at least to the first question. I'll turn it over to Don Taylor to elaborate. Okay. so. Um... Can, can you repeat that again? Because it was a two part question. Sure. Are there tools for faculty finding and bringing new research funding opportunities provided for Virginia Tech? And if yes, where the faculty or when the faculty can start that search process? Okay, so yes. And in fact, I'd, I'd also like to say that, you know, the, uh, the research support systems are more or less fully functional right now. Our office of sponsored programs, uh, our compliance offices are all up and running. Uh, at, at very, very close to 100%. And there are tools to find um, uh, uh, research opportunities during this crisis. And you can go to our website at research.vt.edu. And that's uh, uh, where you would find that. And, um, uh, and of course, you can reach out to my office, uh, OSP or, or whoever you need as well. And uh, we can, we can uh, direct you to those resources. Great. Can maybe add a comment there that um, I think uh, several years ago when we developed the Beyond Boundaries vision for what Virginia Tech could be in a, in a, a generation from now, um, there are several elements of that long range plan that are really coming into focus clearly right now because of the pandemic that has forced us into rethinking the way we do things and, and actually doing them in a way that is more like what we anticipated we would be doing a generation from now. And, one of those areas is in our research enterprise where we have really uh, emphasized transdisciplinarity and working essentially across disciplinary boundaries and a holistic approach to problems. And, and, and nothing is a better illustration of that need than the current COVID-19 crisis where there are so many dimensions. There's the public health dimension, there's the science aspect, there's communications, public policy, of a human element in all, all different ways, every, every way you can imagine. Um, and I think uh, it's it just highlighting that we were pointed in the right direction and uh, that now we are getting a big boost by necessity into the future. So um, I, I'm very excited about the future. We, we have to focus on today and getting through the, the worst of this pandemic. But if you really look at how Virginia Tech is oriented and has been oriented for several years, uh, we are really in a position now where uh, we can really make it clear to the rest of the world why we took this tack. Why did we go off in this direction of beyond boundaries? It, I think it is very clear. And the impact that we're going to have as an institution is, I think, going to grow uh, dramatically after we come out of this uh, current crisis. Uh, President Sands, what, this might be our last question. Um, this comes from an alumnus in Blacksburg and he's wanting to know if there are any resources for recent graduates who are having a hard time finding employment in the midst of this COVID crisis. Oh, that's a great question. I'd invite any of our panelists to jump in with their input, but uh, I think to be perfectly honest, um, we haven't yet wrapped our arms around that longer term impact that some of our alumni and certainly family members of students, students themselves uh, are experiencing right now. Uh, the, the, I think the, the best um, advice I could give is that we're gonna need time to make um, those opportunities uh, come together. And it, we're gonna have to rely on our federal and state and, and local resources uh, to get through the next weeks and months. I would, for those who can, and it's not everybody, uh, this is an opportunity to think hard about where you want to be at the end of this. And uh, there's a huge opportunity over the next year or two, I think. Uh, again, it's dependent on having the base resources to do this, but 
to get yourself into a position to be uh, even in a more in a stronger position from an employment point of view uh, in an after we get through the crisis and and uh, so one of the things we are looking at uh, is how we can better serve um, Hokies our alumni uh, and um, others in the Commonwealth especially uh, to provide the kinds of uh, credentialing the kinds of uh, uh, master's degrees, uh, skills, uh, whatever it may be that will uh, put you in a better position when we come out of this. Because there are going to be opportunities that um, come up that aren't available today. Uh, and there are going to be some avenues of employment that are going to be greatly restricted permanently, I think, because of the crisis. So I would ask uh, any of our employee or alumni and current students even to think hard about what that future might look like and how can you best position yourselves to be in that in, in a in a strong position at the end of the pandemic and and we are going to as an institution um, orient ourselves to be uh, to support those new pathways i think we already were pretty well oriented but we're going to have to reorganize and, and really push to making sure that we're we're meeting those needs for our alumni and our students going forward um, but as those opportunities for more immediate uh, support come to mind, we'll certainly share them via our COVID-19 website. I'd like to invite any of our panelists to maybe add to that, uh, provide any, any detail that you would like. I would, uh, I would simply add that our career and professional development group has been spending uh, the past few years developing very close industry relationships. They're, they're also fully functional, more or less, although they can't do a lot of things on campus. So I would urge students to reach out to uh, career and professional development as well. And what I'm hearing is the demand for some fields is still quite high and, and others is, uh, is, uh, is not quite so high, but um, do reach out to them. Thank you. And President Sands, as we are nearing 12 o'clock or right at it, I'll just ask you if you have any final comments to share before we close. Well, thanks, Don, and, and thanks to everybody for joining us and for sticking out uh, an hour of conversation. Uh, this couldn't be more important to Virginia Tech, to our community, to our students, faculty, staff, uh, to have these kinds of conversations. So we look forward to doing more. If you find it valuable, let us know, and we'll, we'll schedule these on a regular basis. Uh, I, I can think of no more important thing we can do. Uh, of course, we've been describing over the last hour what we think the future holds, what we're doing right now, um, where we have gaps in our understanding of what the future might look like. We've been trying to be uh, as transparent as possible. But the second uh, part of this is just learning from you. So um, as you ask questions, uh, we uh, are able to reorient our thinking to try to address those and provide answers. I, I Maybe one of these last questions regarding uh, alumni and their career uh, transitions. I think that's a great example of something that we've thought about but haven't taken much action uh, on in light of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but we will gear up and, and move fast in that direction uh, over the next couple of weeks and months. So thank you for, for instilling um, hope and uh, thank you for, uh, for all of the support of the community. Uh, and thank you for continuing to stimulate our thinking so that we can be of service to our entire community, to our students, our faculty, staff, and, and the communities where our facilities reside. And I, one last thing I wanted to say is a lot of the conversation here is talk really focused on Blacksburg and our major operations in Blacksburg, but we are aware and we're having conversations around the Commonwealth of the Virginia Tech situation and status in every county, every city throughout the Commonwealth uh, and we're gathering information. Cooperative Extension is everywhere. We've got uh, Agricultural Research and Extension Centers. We've got the Tire Center. We've got all of our operations in Northern Virginia, in uh, Roanoke, uh, Virginia Tech Carillion Partnership. We didn't get a ch chance to talk too much about that. Uh, we've got um, operations in Richmond, so Southside. So the whole Commonwealth is uh, really um, a Virginia Tech's responsibility and so I invite um, you to continue to submit questions and we'll do our best to answer the ones we haven't answered today. Thank you. Thank you, President Sands. And thank you as well to all the members of the Virginia Tech Incident Response Team for being here with us to help answer questions. And thank all of you for all the work you're doing to help us get through this together. And I'd like to 